The list of positive influences in my life is a long, long list. I was blessed to be born into a home where both dad and mom were trying to follow Christ, and they didn't always get it right, but they made the effort. They went at it hard. I also had six grandparents, all kinds of sets, that lived right around us in a 15 to 20-mile circumference from our place. And honestly, I couldn't go anywhere in our small town that either my parents or my grandparents didn't know what I was doing and who I was with. Aunts and uncles that were good influences, cousins, uh, not quite so much so. I've been blessed as an adult to have four men that have coached me and mentored me, men that were further along in Christ than I am and have shown me what it means to be a godly husband, a godly, uh, a godly dad, a godly pastor, somebody that goes after Christ. I am blessed right now with friends that are deeper than any friendships I've ever had, particularly this pastoral team. Eight other guys who, who walk with me as we attempt to serve and to lead Westside, who hold me accountable, who come at me when I need it and love on me when I need it. By far, the greatest human influence in my life has been after the, the last one, my wife herself, has been my kids and my grandkids. It seems strange that we learn from the very people we're trying to teach, but if in fact we're teachable, we do. And my wife, wow. I had the blessing of marrying somebody that was further along in Christ than I was, and I've been trying for 35 years to catch up. But the faster I run, the faster she gains ground on me. It's just been an amazing thing. I've had a few negative influences, a couple of friends in high school that were not helpful, a couple of friends in college that weren't too helpful either. But I'm putting this list of people that have influenced me in front of you for this very reason. I hope you're thinking about who influences you. We begin a new series today called Under the Influence. It's just a two-part series, two weeks, punch one and punch two, and then we're done with it. But it's a big, big, important series. Here's the big idea for the series. Find your notes right now, whether you're joining us at Lenexa here in the big room or over in the venue. We're glad that you're here up at Speedway and one of the services there, maybe up at Lansing and Minimum Security or Maximum Security. We have services there every Sunday. Sunday, and a lot of folks joining us on the internet. What an amazing thought. We hope you'll fully participate in what God is doing in and at and through Westside today. Here's the big idea. Write it into your notes. You ready to go? Here it is. God expects us to be good managers of our influences. He expects us. He expects it, guys. He's not hoping. He's not encouraging it. He's expecting us to be good managers of our influences. Now, that includes who influences us, which is what we're talking about this week, but it also includes who do we influence that we will look at next week as well. Two influence questions as we begin today's teaching, and the first one is the title of the lesson itself, Who Influences You? Think about that that. Now, most of us are aware of who's influenced our past, but we're not necessarily as aware who, who, of who is influencing us in the present, who influences us. And the Scripture literally gives it to us. Look at what it says in the book of Proverbs. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Now, we could stop right now, and many of us could tell a story about that associating with fools and getting in trouble. I mean, you hang with the wrong crowd, pretty much you're going to do what the wrong crowd does. That is the reality of life. And some of you are thinking, well, who am I sitting with and what am I doing here with them? The idea literally is that we choose by who we spend time with what we will become like. In fact, write this in your notes. We become like the people we spend the most time with. It's not because we try to. It's because it's human nature. We become like the people we spend the most time with. So the answer to who influences you is real simple. Who are you spending time with? Who are you around? Who are you deliberately doing life with? That determines who and what we become. And then the second question goes along with it. Well, if, I, if I'm going to become like people I spend time with, how can I tell what kind of influence they're going to have on me? 
How do I know? I mean, I hear people say all the time, you can't really tell what's inside a person. Listen close. I could not disagree more. I believe what's inside a person is obvious. In fact, Jesus tells us that. He's talking to his disciples one day about how do you discern the kind of person somebody is. And listen to his words. You can identify them by their fruit. And then he explains that. Don't you know some of those disciples are going, people have fruit? What's that about? Jesus says, let me explain it. That is by the way they act. Would you circle the word act? Just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Circle actions. It's not difficult to discern what's going on inside somebody. Why? Because character, write this in, big idea, is always displayed by attitudes and actions. The character of a person is displayed by the attitude they carry and the actions going on in their lives. I hear statements like this from time to time. Well, he's really a good guy. He's just making some dumb decisions. No! He's really a dumb guy that's making dumb decisions. He's really a foolish guy that's making foolish decisions. Jesus said, by your actions you are known. Because how you act tells us who you are on the inside. Don't buy this idea that you can be a good person and do bad things. That's just not a biblical idea. we got to grab this. Who's influencing you and what kind of influence are they having? That's the preliminary. Here's the practices we want to put in place in our lives if we're going to be careful about who influences us. And as we do this today, would you ask God to just speak to you about the one of these three that has your name on it? Just whisper that prayer to him right now. Lord, speak to me today. Because all of us, this is one of those rare lessons where it applies to everyone in the room. We all struggle with this idea of influence. Number one, limit the negative influences in your life. If we're going to go hard after Christ, you have to limit the negative influences in your life. Now, we've already read, if you hang out with wise people, you become wise. And if you hang out with fools, you get in trouble. Look at what this verse says. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. We circle the word company. It does not mean if you hang, out one, hang around once in a while with someone, you're doomed to, to do what they do. The word company literally comes from the same word where we get a company, and it means to camp out with to do life with, to spend big pieces of time with. If your constant company is people of bad character, guess what? None of us are strong enough that that doesn't affect us. Now, some folks have taken this to the Puritan level of saying, if I'm a Christ follower, I can't hang out with anybody else that's not a Christ follower. There's a couple of problems with that. One, it's just not very practical. But secondly, it's not biblical. Jesus taught us to spend time with all kinds of people. In fact, remember what he said? You are the light of the world, he told his disciples. But if you hide that light under a shade, if you try to keep yourself from the world in every way, then nobody in the darkness can even be reached. I think Jesus himself is our model. Who did he spend most of his time with? With 12 disciples that he camped with, that were his company, his constant companions. But who else did he spend time with? Oh, this is a fun list. Prostitutes, bartenders, tax collectors, which is kind of like the IRS gone crooked. That may be redundant. He spent time with people that his disciples were being asked, your master hangs out with sinners. What's up with that? And Jesus' response was, I came as the great physician, not to those who are well, but to those who are sick. This is not eliminate anybody that's not honoring God in your life. This is limit yourself to how much influence and time you spend with them. 
Now, already, as I'm saying, you need to limit some negative influences. Some of you are thinking of people you ought to limit. Write their names in. Do you see it right there? It literally asks the question, influences I need to limit. If they're sitting next to you, use a code word. <laughs> Write in a name of some people. You need to limit their influence. I'll tell you this honestly. While we were parenting our kids and they were home, there were family members in my extended family that I only allowed my kids to have limited exposure to because they were that negative and they were that nasty. There were friends that they would have chosen that I would not allow them to have big time with. Now, I didn't shut off all time with them, but really was careful to manage that. And here's the deal. Most of us would agree that we have to limit the negative influences for our kids, but we don't practice it for ourselves. Can I ask you a question? Are your kids getting the lesson that you're speaking or the one that you're living? Because if they never see me limit who I hang with based on this, how will they ever learn to do the same thing? we got to be careful. Limit the negative, ungodly influences in your life. Number two, you got to maximize the positive influencers in your life. Maximize it. I love this verse out of Hebrews. Check it out. Remember your leaders, would you speak, would circle the word leaders, we're going to come back to it, who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate, would you circle imitate? So you got leaders circled and imitate. Imitate their faith. The writer of Hebrews is pointing out a big idea right here. When we're first learning something, we often learn by imitation, I'm in an absolutely fun place with our two-year-old grandson, Justice. He does everything he sees Papa doing. If I put on my baseball cap to get ready to watch K-State beat Baylor, <laughs> just lost half the crowd. He puts on his baseball cap. If I get on my jacket to go outside because it's cold, he puts on his jacket. If I say something that's kind of attitudinally incorrect, he just says the same words and doesn't even know what it is that he has said. He's at the I'm going to imitate Papa stage of life. Now, you're all telling me it's going to end. I know, but just let me enjoy my fantasy here for a while, okay? I mean, it's an amazing thing of influence. How do we learn? We literally consciously sometimes and unconsciously sometimes find someone that's ahead of us and we imitate them. Now, rather than run from that, Paul embraced it. He told his disciples, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In other words, when you see me going after Jesus, you go after Jesus the same way. Now, how do we apply this? Every area of life is how we apply it. You want your marriage to improve? Find a couple that have been married a little longer than you are and a little stronger than you are and hang out with them. Maximize their influence. Find someone that treat each other the way you like to see couples treat each other and learn from them. Imitate them. Find a great dad, men, or a great mom, ladies, that you can hang with and learn how to parent your kids in the same way. Many of us did not have great examples from our growing up years. Doesn't mean they're not out there. Where do you look for examples like that? I don't know. Church? Just a thought. Life group? Places where you can hang with people? I still have all kinds of people in my life that are ahead of me in one or two areas of the faith, some of them ahead of me across the board in the faith, and I deliberately hang with them to maximize their influence into my life. Now, some of you are thinking right now, I know some people that I need to be under their influence. You see it? Influences I need to maximize. Write some names down. Now, if you don't have any, that's the point. If you can't think of several just like this, that's the point. 
We got to get back to learning mode and to imitating mode if we're going to continue to grow to be like Christ. Huge idea. Number one, limit the negative influences. Number two, maximize the positive. Scripture teaches these clearly. But the third point, listen close, is the main idea today. And I really think we're about to have just an incredible experience with God this morning. And I want to invite you to really examine this idea. Because it is so clearly biblical, it applies to everyone in the room. We want to surrender to the greatest influence of all. Jesus can be described so many ways. But he absolutely is the greatest influence the world has ever known. And the scripture teaches us in the book of James that in the end, it really comes down to one issue. Surrender to God. Surrender to Jesus. Billy Graham is just such a phenomenal man of God. And I heard him speak one time several years ago now where he said, I believe many Americans are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. The difference between what they believe here and what they've done here. And he went on to explain it, and it has just fascinated me and eventually become my conviction as well. There are a lot of Americans who give mental agreement to this Jesus thing. Yeah, I think he's the Son of God. Yeah. His, his teachings are awesome. Yeah, he, he's worth paying attention to. Yeah, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Not sure he's the only way, but, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking he may be. I'm in. Are you watching? But they've never surrendered. This is one of those times where a word that's translated from Greek over to English just doesn't carry enough zip Belief is never in the New Testament just mental agreement. In fact, in the book of James, it says, the demons believe and they tremble. Now, I've never met anybody who believes Satan and his demons are saved and going to heaven. But it clearly says they know who God is. Clearly says they understand who Jesus is. What have they not done? What have many of us not done that causes us to believe here but to never act here? Are you watching? It's about surrender. Lord, I move from belief to surrender. Jesus, I do believe you're the Son of God, so I'm trusting you with my life. I do believe you're the way to heaven, so I'm trusting you to take me to heaven. Lord, I do believe in you, so I'm giving everything I know about me to you. It's surrender. Scripture says there will be a day when this world has ended that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. If that's the big event that starts off our new adventure into heaven, why wouldn't we take that step now? It's about surrender. If mental belief would get us there, guys, we'd all be going. I grew up in the church. I can't tell you when I began to believe because I'd heard about Jesus from the time I was two and three and four on. I was in church nine months before I was born. Some of you are going to get that halfway through lunch. <laughs> but at age 17, I remember a moment where I knelt and I said, I surrender. Lord, I give up. I can't do this. You can. I'm in. The thought that any of us would be trusting just belief scares me. The thought we'd be trusting, hey, I go to West Side, that'll get me there. No, we're a great group of people to make the journey with, but we can't get you there. It's about surrender. And in these next few moments, we're going to do business with God around the idea of surrender. So I'm going to ask nobody to be moving 
all of us just to be staying right here and staying focused in. There's two acts of surrender that really, really matter. The first one is initial surrender. Would you write that in your notes? It's initial surrender. This is how we come to faith in Christ. This is when we move from head knowledge, yeah, I believe Jesus is really God, to, and since I believe it, I'm giving him my life. I'm giving him my heart, my soul, my passion, my direction. I'm surrendering everything I know about me to whatever I know about him. Initial surrender. That's a deliberate act, guys. It's really hard to totally surrender and not know when you did it. Oh, if you're talking about a growing belief, I get it. My belief continues to grow. But my surrender, December 2nd, 1973. Deliberate moment. If you're not sure about that initial moment of surrender, we're going to give you a chance to do that in just a few minutes. But there's another act of surrender that's equally important. It's called continual surrender. Would you write it in? And this is for those of us who have initially surrendered. We have put Jesus fully in charge of our lives, but there's a problem. What's the problem? Me. I'm the problem. Because I invite him to take the wheel, and I like how he drives for a while, and then I say, move over, Jesus. I got some other ideas. Now, some of you are saying, I've never done that. Sure you did. When you yelled at your wife, you did that. When you yelled at your kids, you did that. When you got that attitude of, I can't stand that guy. Yeah, we did that. Any moment that there's an attitude or an action that doesn't reflect Jesus, guess who's in charge again? If you know a person's character by what they do, then if Jesus is in charge, he doesn't do that stuff. But when I'm in charge, I do. So what do I do? I re-surrender. Lord, I am so sorry I stepped back into being in control of that. My anger was not of you. My attitude's wrong. Forgive me. You're in charge again. Now, how many times you got to do that? How many times you're going to blow it is the answer. Some days I do this all day long. According to my wife, some days I don't do it nearly enough. I just watched Band of Brothers for the first time all the way through. Phenomenal series that follows the, the, the adventures of E Company through World War II. And in the 10th or the 11th episode, either the last one or next to last, I don't remember, the Germans begin surrendering in mass. And there was their initial surrender where they laid down their weapons and raised the white flag. But they had to continue to surrender for the hundreds of miles they had to walk from where they were back into Allied-occupied territory, surrendering every step of the way. What a picture of what it means to follow Christ. Initial surrender? Yes. Continual surrender? Yes. We're not done. Put your notes somewhere where you can reach them. But put them aside for a moment so they won't be a distraction. We're going to offer a chance for people to surrender today. And this is a big thing. We're going to let the front of this room become an altar. Up at Speedway, it'll be the, the front there in the theater. Up in the prisons, it'll be the front of the room. If you're watching on the internet, you just pick some object in the living room or the coffee shop or uh, the porch where you're watching. You just make it an altar in your mind. Nobody surrenders by accident. It's deliberate. You don't accidentally raise a white flag. And in the next few moments, we're going to invite two groups of people to surrender. If you're in that crowd that you believe, but you're not certain you've ever surrendered totally to Jesus, the band's going to lead us in a song. We're all going to be standing, and I'm going to invite you to come and to stand here at this altar and pray a prayer in your own words that says, Jesus, I am surrendering. I believe, but I need to settle this. I'm raising the white flag. I'm giving everything I know about me to what I know about you. There's no special words. It's an act of surrender. 
And you can kneel here or you can stand here for a few moments. And when you're done, there's a piece of white cloth down here just like this. I just invite you to pick one up and go back to your seat. I'll give you instructions later about what to do with it. There's a second group of people that I want to invite to surrender today. And that's those of us that have surrendered initially. We know that we've given everything to Jesus, but we've taken pieces of it back. Now, how do you know if that's you? If there's an action or an attitude in your life that's not reflecting Jesus, that's you. If you're not certain, ask the person you're with. They'll help you. And I invite you to use this as an altar today and to stand here for a moment or to kneel here and re-surrender to Christ. And then you too, pick up one of these pieces of cloth. Go back to your seat. Now, this is not everybody come forward and grab a piece of cloth. No, that's not it. This is if you're doing business with God for initial surrender or continual surrender, come do it and then grab one. We're going to have some pastors down front, men and women. They'll be facing the crowd. They're there in case you need to talk with someone or pray with someone. But you can just ignore them as well and come and kneel and pray, stand and pray. Pick one of these up, go back to your seat. Now, if you're wondering right now if you ought to do that, can I help you? The enemy wouldn't nudge you to surrender to Jesus. That's not something you'd work up on your own. That's the Spirit of God calling you in. We're going to pray together, and then we'll surrender. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I pray right now for the people in the room, on the internet, wherever they are, all that are watching, that need to practice that initial surrender to you today. Lord, would you lead them to step forward and to surrender? And Jesus, I pray as well for those of us that have surrendered, but Lord, we've taken charge again. We're acting in ways, thinking in ways that don't honor you. We surrender again today. Would you make this time extremely real to us and this act of surrender extremely big? It's our prayer in Christ. Amen. Jesus, we do surrender. Help us live the commitments we've just made. Help us surrender all of ourselves to you. We surrender all, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Would you please be seated? There's some folks still dealing here at the front, and that's awesome. We invite them to continue. Let me give you a little bit of instruction today because the act of surrender is not yet done. That cloth that you picked up, I want you to tie this somewhere where you're going to run into it several times a day. Now, we did this a little over a year ago, and I tied it to my wrist and wore it till it fell off six months later. Now, it was grungy gray by the time it fell off, but it reminded me every time I snagged it on the shower door. It reminded me every time someone asked me. It reminded me every time it pulled the hair on my arm. That surrender is continual. For some of us, you ought to tie it on the rearview mirror of your car because I've seen how you drive. <laughs> and surrender would be a good word. For others, it needs to be tied to the refrigerator door. Tie it somewhere where you're going to see it several times a day. It's an act of surrender. Secondly, if you came forward today and surrendered or re-surrendered, I'm going to ask you to do something. We're still doing acts of surrender here. Every one of you that came forward, would you find your bulletin and tear off the connect card that is in there? Every one of you. Some of you are going, I don't need to do that. I want you to do that. I'll tell you why in one moment. Every one of you, if you came forward as another act of surrender, tear that off. I'm going to invite you to write just your name on the card. That's all. And then at the bottom, one of two choices. If today was an initial surrender moment for you, the first time you know for certain you totally surrendered your life to Christ, would you write, I surrendered today on the bottom of that card? If it was your initial moment of surrender, write, I surrendered today. Just your name in that statement. 
Others of you, you came and it was an act of continual surrender. Would you also put your name on the card and then put on the bottom, I re-surrendered today? Now, why am I asking you to do that? It's been a long time since I've done something like this. Because I'm going to pray personally for every name, every person that came forward this week. And if I don't have your name, I can't pray for you. I realize it will be thousands. Love it. Love it. It's an honor to be one of your pastors. And on behalf of that team, I want to tell you today how proud we are of you. For your initial surrender, I surrendered today. Or your re-surrender, I re-surrendered today. We'd like to pray for you this week. You can drop that card with just that simple info on it in the offering basket when it comes by in a moment. Or if you're not done with it, you can put it out in the offering basket on your way out. If you'd still like to talk with somebody further, those people are in the next steps room right out here in the commons. You can be part of that as well. Some of you are going nuts because you're going, Dan, you left out a blank. No, I didn't. Let's land it. Are you ready? I want you to sleep this afternoon. Take that nap. God wants us to surrender, wants us under his influence. Why? Because his plan is to build his character in you first and then use you to build his character in others. Isn't that an amazing thought? He wants to influence us so that we can take that same godly influence and use it to influence others. What an amazing, amazing truth. Bless you for surrendering today. Thank you so much for your surrender today, your worship today. Hey, in your bulletin today, there's a list of people that have fully engaged with Westside. They are new members. They're part of who we are. We honor them and are grateful for them. And one of the things they did in that process was a Get Connected class to all of you who surrendered today or who re-surrendered. I want to encourage you, do that Get Connected thing. That's the place where you start the journey to gathering in all that Jesus has planned for you in and through Westside and in and through your relationship with him. Some of you are saying, I came through a class a couple years back, three years back, different thing. It's been totally reworked. It is an amazing experience. In fact, we're offering it twice this week, once Tuesday night, once Saturday, two hours. That info is in your bulletin. You can fill it in and say, I'll come, or you can just get the information outside in the commons at the information table. It's got a sign that says, get connected. Kathy Getz will be out there to help you. Hey, if you've got kids or grandkids or neighbors with kids or grandkids, you don't want to miss Family Fest this afternoon, 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock, rides galore, fun galore. Hadn't God given us a great day for this? I hope you'll come, bring your neighbors. It's free. Isn't that a cool price? It is free. Come and be part of that this weekend. A great experience. There's a handprint on the passenger side of my pickup that perfectly matches the two-year-old handprint of my grandson because it's his. It's dirty, slimy, greasy. I don't know when he did it. I don't know how it got there. I just know he's playing around the truck one day, and there it is. It's been there for months. I refuse to wash it because <laughs> it's a reminder that God wants to use me to influence him. We have such an opportunity for influence. That's what we're going to talk about next week. Hope you'll be here. Stay surrendered, church. God bless.